Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another Chem Complete lecture for the Organic Chemistry series. And in today's lecture, we are going to take a look at what contributes to the stability of alkenes and pi double bonds in organic structures. So we're going to take a look at all of that coming up on the channel right now. Thank you so much for choosing to learn with me today. And as a quick reminder, if you head on over to chemcomplete.com, we've got lots of free resources available, as well as detailed paid for guides for a subject that you might be struggling with, such as spectroscopy, substitution reactions, aromaticity, and many others. It's a great way to support the channel. So one more time, chemcomplete.com, head on over there and see what's available to help you. So stability of alkenes. We want to focus on what makes alkenes stable and which alkenes would be considered more stable than others in a relative comparison. So the first thing when we get started with this subject that we want to realize is that alkenes do not have free rotation around their double bond or their pi bond. And this is important because this can set up certain situations where you can lock components into place that are around a double bond. So when we look at Newman projections and sigma bonds, we really see the free rotation where things can kind of orient themselves in an optimal way in order to avoid sterics or having some sort of a non-favorable setup. However, when we get to double bonds, the locking in place of substituents can become problematic in certain situations. So keeping in mind that we have no free rotation around the double bond is important when we're examining this particular topic. So when we look at double bonds, we want to first consider for alkenes that there are stereoisomers that can be present and they primarily exist for disubstituted alkenes when we first start looking at them. However, this is certainly true of tri-substituted alkenes and tetra-substituted alkenes that have a, for the disubstituted, where they have one hydrogen on each carbon of the pi bond, and then for the tri and the tetra, they could have other groups. And we're kind of looking at the size of those groups and how they would prefer to be oriented. So most people, when they are coming into organic chemistry, within the first couple of uh, units, they learn about cis and trans stereochemistry. So maybe you've heard about this with cyclic compounds where something is above or below the ring, axial and equatorial positions, and so on. But this is also true for double bonds. So when we take a look at a cis double bond, Cis is going to refer to the larger non-hydrogen groups that are going to be on the same side of the alkene. So to give you a brief example, if I had hydrogens that were attached to a double bond, both of them would be on the same side of the double bond. And then a larger group, let's use methyls in this case, would be on the same side of the double bond as well. So this can create certain problems where we get into steric constraints because we have the larger groups in closer proximity to one another. Now the trans stereochemistry, on the other hand, is going to be where they are on the opposite side of the alkene. So those larger non-hydrogen groups will now be on opposite sides. So now where that first hydrogen was in the upper left corner, we'll go ahead and we'll put a methyl there draw the pi bond, and then we're going to have the methyl, the other methyl, on the opposite side or facing the opposite direction or face of the double bond. And this is the trans substitution pattern that we can see there for the substituents. Now, when we take a look at this, trans is going to be the energetically preferred isomer because it's going to avoid the steric strain that would be present in the cis component. So if you were to look at one of those examples, if we have the carbon-carbon double bond and we've got two of the larger groups on the same side, these larger groups come closer to one another. And so you are going to get this interference or this steric proportionality that's going to come or be present right inside of here. So the main concern here is that we would have sterics, and so that means that the cis conformation is not going to be as preferred as the trans conformation, where again, if we're just focused on these larger groups, we can see 
that they are going to be on the opposite sides. And so we are clear in terms of these groupings of them interfering with one another. Now you still might get some interaction between the methyl groups and the hydrogens, but that's going to be far preferable in comparison to having the larger groups. And methyl is just one example. We can certainly get bulkier groups like T-butyl groups, even an ethyl group, and so on, that is going to create even larger steric problems. So the main point here is that of the two stereoisomers, the trans form is going to be the, for, the form that is preferred for the alkenes as far as stability is concerned. Now, it's also important to mention that as alkenes increase in substituents, they still prefer to keep lower sterics. However, net stability is going to going, excuse me, however, net stability increases overall. Okay, so what that means is that if I have, let's say, something like this, where I have an ethyl group, and then I've got a carbon carbon double bond, and then on this other side, I'm going to have a methyl and an ethyl. We would prefer put the methyl up on this side and the ethyl away from the other ethyl. Because again, these are larger groups. And so we want to keep the larger groups further away from one another. But what it means by the net stability increases overall is that as we get rid of these hydrogens and we put alkyl substituents here in place of them, even though this is getting bulkier and we potentially have more sterics, that is going to kind of be counteracted by another phenomenon that we come across in organic chemistry. And we're going to take a look at that here in a moment. And I do want to take one side step here and just mention that when you have more than two substituents, the naming drops cis and trans and uses E and Z as the naming format. So you'll hear that Z is equivalent to the two larger groups being on the same side or cis, and then that Z is going to be, I'm sorry, E is going to be trans or the opposite sides. Now, it is also important to realize that E and Z are just naming techniques. They do not necessarily correlate to the cis and trans stability factors. They're just for naming purposes. Okay, now the stability order that we find here is that monosubstituted alkenes are going to be the least stable of the bunch. So that means that if I have one where we've got a single R group, and the R group just represents some sort of alkyl group, and then the rest of these are hydrogens, making it monosubstituted, that is going to be the least stable of the bunch, followed by the disubstituted, which we will show in the trans preferred state here, keeping again in mind that you could have cis and trans, and cis should be lower on the stability list, meaning that it's not as stable as the trans form. And then that will be surpassed by the tri-substituted. So now we've got three different alkyl groups that would be present here. It could be any of these three positions, and then one hydrogen that would remain. And then finally, the stablest of the bunch is going to be the tetra substituted and that's going to be where we've got the r groups present as all four substituents so we don't have any remaining hydrogens directly involved with the carbon carbon double bond or the pi bond okay now the reason behind this because it seems like again we're piling up sterics here which would be problematic is that you're going to get an increase in stability due to the effects of the neighboring alkyl groups, specifically hyperconjugation. Now, if you're not familiar with hyperconjugation, I do have a separate lecture that explains hyperconjugation on the channel. So I will make sure that I leave that down in the description box below. So if you're confused as to what hyperconjugation is and how it works, I do have a lesson on that. It really uh, pertains to carbocations in that lesson. However, the same general premise is going to apply here it really has to do with the electronic alignment of carbon hydrogen bonds that are neighboring to the p orbitals that are involved in the pi bond okay so when we take a look at something like this it means that as we have these carbon carbon double bonds these carbons have to have a p orbital available in order to host the pi electrons and so when we've got a carbon group that has a carbon hydrogen bond adjacent it's this interaction i'm showing with the dotted line here this alignment with the p orbital 
that helps to stabilize the alkenes as far as the multiple substituent pattern. That's hyperconjugation. So I just want to mention here that in molecular orbital theory, in MO theory, an alkene pi bond is going to have two p orbitals that make up a pi bonding orbital, and then you would also have a pi anti-bonding orbital. And in this case, the two pi electrons are going to fill the pi bonding orbital first, and then they would go to the pi anti-bonding orbital, which we normally will represent with a little star or asterisk next to the pi symbol. So the carbon here, we would have a p orbital, you have your sigma bond here, and then you've got your other p orbital. Now there are going to be two electrons that are going to fill up the orbitals involved in the pi bond and be shared between these orbitals. Okay, and from an MO theory perspective, you would have a pi bonding orbital that is lower in energy. This would be full. We fill this up first with our electrons, and then you would also get a resulting pi with a star there. That is the anti-bonding orbital, and this one is going to be empty. It does not have any electrons involved in it and it would be vacant for all purposes and this empty p orbital is really where the hyperconjugation is going to take effect and help to stabilize the conjugation excuse me the uh, uh, pi uh, p orbitals okay so that is an explanation as to why the stability increases as we increase the number of substituents that are alkyl in nature you get hyperconjugation that's coming in to stabilize those p orbitals particularly the anti-bonding pi orbital that would form in the molecular orbital theory so that pretty much covers stability of alkenes you really want to understand the larger groups that are locked in place being away from one another in a cis trans type of pattern and then also realize that as the alkyl groups continue to increase around the double bond you're going to get greater stability due to the hyper conjugation effects that would be surrounding the p orbitals present there so thank you so much for learning with chem complete today i know there's lots of other options out there one more time chemcomplete.com for all of your needs like the video if it helped you because it helps with getting our material in the algorithms if you comment or have any questions i'll try to get back to you and as always subscribing is going to be your best bet for staying up to date throughout all of your chemistry journeys other than that i hope everybody has a great rest of the day and i will see everybody in the next lecture